I'm gonna start the recording. So how do I share? I can share a whiteboard. For most students, can you see my whiteboard? Uh, we, oh yeah, we can. Yeah. It's quite nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where's my, my drawing tools? My drawing tools for, oh goodness. Uh, so let's talk about one to one to many relationships. That's what we've been seeing so far. You have a few many to many. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's increase this text size. Does everyone who can explain to me how a one to many works? Michael, a one to many relationship. Let's say I have uh, users, a user table, and then I have I have some other table. What what kind of table would be a one to many for users? I said the users are being related to um, whatever table. Addresses. And we want to make it so that one user can have many addresses. Uh, so we have an ID column and we have something like Name, first name, last name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Likewise, over here, we have an ID, and IDs are always unique. When you make an ID column, you want to when you say primary key. That implies that no two values are going to be the same in this column. So if I have a one and a two and a three, let's say I have the same on this side. Here, when we say user ID, what does how does this relate to a user? Yeah, I think um, the table for the users so it connects the address to it. It connects, so it just matches up. Hmm. So if I want Sally to have this street address. If I want Sally to have both of these, what do I do? User ID will be one for both of them. And this would be Betty's address. Uh, 
Okay, so that's pretty, pretty clear cut. I'm gonna copy this so I can use it later. And let's go to a one-to-one. One-to-one -one is a, a little less common than one-to-many. Uh, can I? I can't undo. <laughs> oh, here. Can I edit it? I am recording. Yes. So if I have something like passport, you're only supposed to have one passport. This would be something like passport number. Oh goodness. <laughs> How will we make this a one to one? Only one pass, the passport can only have one user, and a user can only have one passport. We would still want a foreign key. We have this user ID here. The user ID Say say that again. Could you get rid of user ID? Could I get rid of user ID? as user ID and then run Um because you're only doing one. The you'd have you'd have to associate the passport ID with the user ID somehow. Uh, you can't match these two IDs directly because uh, they might not be in the same order. Okay. You'd have to match them together somehow in a way where you can only, this can't happen. Here, Betty has two passports. Yeah, you have to set this as unique. So what Ethan was saying is right, that we normally don't use one-to-ones that often uh, because normally they would be one table. And why have two separate tables for something that I have one? Uh, the, the answer in, in Django is, is we have security built up. You know, a bunch of smart people already built security for us. Rather than make it ourselves, we use their user. But rather than edit their user, we can just make a one-to-one -one relationship and add our own characteristics to the user table. But we talked about, you, you might have seen a many-to-many. -many. How does a many-to-many -many work? So users and can anyone think of a many-to-many -many for user? friends. So if this is Facebook, it would be to users, <laughs> which, which this, let's, let's do this one first. So when we have, when we're joining to the, the same table to itself with a many to many, how, how might that look? Yet another, yet another table. In order to do many, you have to have a table to tie the two together. Yeah. Okay, to tie the two together. And these will be the same table, so the columns will be will be the same. I'm not going to change that for now. 
So we'll draw another table. Can I copy? I can copy it. Okay. So here I have, you know, normally in a, in a join table, we'll call it user users. It might be another, another example of a, a one, a many to many would be groups. So if you had something like meetup, uh, you can be a member of many groups and each group can have many members. Yes. You can be, have, you can be a member of many groups and those same groups can have many users inside. And the join table would normally look like this. Uh, it's not, it's too, too low. user groups would have its own ID. And then it would have a user ID. And a group ID. And the reason this works is because these are not unique. You can repeat user ID in this column. You can repeat a group ID in that column. This ID will be unique, but these, you can have the same user in, a, in different groups. So this user has many groups, yet this group has many users. So group two has both user one and 45. And user one has both groups two and three. Does, does, that, does that explain how it works? Okay. Now, if it's user, if you're gonna include anything besides these three columns in a join table, you're probably gonna to wanna to rename it. So these three columns are expressly to make a many-to-many -many relationship and nothing else. It doesn't store any other data besides the relationship between what users are in what groups. But let's say, let's go back to the user to user. I'm gonna call it something else because I'm gonna store more data in it. Because I have two users, I'm going to need to call them different things for this example. Uh, I might call one user the, the friend D and the friender. And these will, these will actually be user IDs. Now that I've, I've given it an appropriate name to describe the kind of data it stores, I can add additional data. And it's more than just a join table. I can say, say start 
time. I can add all sorts of stuff to pertain to this relationship. <laughs> Same thing with uh, a group. Let's say, let's say, let's go back to the the group example. If I had a join table called user group, I'm doing pro right now. This would be description. I'm just going to finish this one. Maybe I can't. <laughs> All right. So if I have this, this user groups table, and here I have a group ID, and it's just a join table. I don't have anything here. Let's say I want to store some some additional data besides just this this many to many relationship <laughs> what would i rename it to justin what would you name the relationship for the group yeah what would i rename the user groups table as instead of just a join table between user and group if i wanted to store more information about the relationship between the user and the group. So in this example, Sally, which is user one, and hiking, which is group two, Sally is in the hiking group. Yes. And let's say I want to store the date she joined. Now the table is actually storing information of its own. It's not just a join table. I can what? Throw the join date in there. Join that date. Okay, let's throw it in there. The then user groups isn't a good name anymore because that implies it's just a join table. Group information. It has to pertain to users and groups. Group join. Hmm. <laughs> group join. Group date. User groups sounds better at this point. Okay. I, I would call it uh, membership. Or roster, something. Try and find something different that's not just a combination of the words to describe what it is. Membership. Membership. Plural noun. Multiple. Mm hmm. And I can just keep it at user ID here instead of naming it something else. I had to name it something else because we were joining users to themselves. And I couldn't have two columns with the same name of user ID. So are you saying in cases where you know you're going to expand that table or just best practices, probably not a good idea to call pooling tables a mixture of two names? Um, 
expandability, I guess. For expandability, I would I would just change it when when you add it. Okay, so when the table gets expands, mm -hmm. then, then you can change the name. Otherwise, so if you uh, if you have a join table, it has the benefit of being a join table, but you also want to create a separate table that has the same information that ever thing. So like memberships as the first mm -hmm. uh, two columns that uh, user groups did. Would there be a benefit to making memberships in addition to a join table for users and groups? Um, the question was, is there a benefit to making memberships in addition to uh, a separate join table for a user groups yeah. table? And uh, I'd say probably not. Uh, if, if you wanted a separate join table, maybe you could make a one-to-one -one relationship between memberships and the join table. Um, maybe if you had a bunch of code that was already written for, for that join table, you can make a memberships table. But at that point, you would make a separate table to add the join date to each unique ID of membership. Mm -hmm. Then you can make a separate table that just has join date and inherited membership underscore ID. The memberships, or not inherit, but uh, so the I didn't specify before, but one to many and many to one are the same thing. So don't don't think they're different. It's just what order they are. And then the other kinds are many, many, and one to one. And with that, let's look at the examples. Did anyone did anyone turn in their design? Oh, pull request. Who who wants to? How oh Hal and I will. Hal and you? Okay. Actually, let me just clone it. Mm. Uh, oh, I have to undo my share and share my screen. All right. So one thing I forgot to go over was how to rewind and get. I guess someone, somebody, somebody had listened to me in, in making commits when it worked, but uh, during the assessment and, and they couldn't rewind. So here's how you rewind. You get log. And unfortunately, git log is one of those places where uh, control C and control D don't work. Control D seems to just go down. Control C doesn't go. You have to press Q to get out. Just Q without any modifier keys. And you can get out. Git log. Can, you control plus a couple times? can I control plus a couple times? Yes. Command plus. Oh, yes. Oh, that, oh, this is good or bigger? Bigger. Bigger. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's all the way at the bottom. Ah, okay. So recapping, I can get out of this by pressing Q. I can see it by going git log. And the git log will show me uh, from top down the latest commits. I have this one on Tuesday, uh, and this one a few seconds later, <laughs> and, or was this one a few minutes earlier? This one's earlier, it goes earlier and earlier and earlier. 
Yeah, it didn't have uh, the correct name on it, so I had to recommit it. Ah, so it was like five minutes. I mean, that's 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 a good time period. Let's say I want to go to still in the planning pages, planning stages. I'm gonna copy the beginning of this this crazy number here. This is called a a SHA. I'm gonna copy it. And I say git reset dash dash hard and then paste the SHA. Paste the SHA. Oh, I, I for, I'm gonna control U to go back and delete it all. And I'm going to actually copy it because I press control instead of command. So I'm gonna copy just the beginning of it. You can copy the whole thing to make you feel better. And command C and a Q and get reset hard. That SHA. <coughs> and it says head, that's where you are. You you are where the head is of the snake. And it is now at this SHA. We have, we have we have a plan here. Now, oh no, I I lost everything. When I get log, I don't have the things that I had before. So I rewind it to the save point, but all the save points I had, where are they? Get log won't will only show you what's in the past of where you are right now. But if you do get ref log. I'll post this all in the in the a little a little write up in the channel. Get ref log will show you what you've done. You 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 have a your little history of what you did. This is where we are now. This you, head is where you are. Um, but this this one. We did a reset. That's what we just did. We reset moving to this SHA and that's where we are at this SHA but if we want to go back to this SHA we just get reset hard that SHA and we, we are back where we started All right. I think we can go a little smaller now. So what do we have here? Code, SQL. We have a bunch of, of tables. Ooh, OK. So is there a place that you wrote out the, the structure of your database? Or did you just make it? I made it in the website and then brought it in. Oh, in the website, okay. Which, by the way, bringing that in from the website kind of sucks. Well, oh. The website had a way to export to SQL, didn't it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. The website has a way to export to SQL, which I didn't even know. <laughs> but it's good. You got to type some SQL. Okay. So let's try running it. Blue apron schema. As a question, is there a, well, one of the issues that we ran into that we actually solved is, was the order of the drops matters if some of the tables exist and they depend on each other. Yeah. Ah, the order of the drop, the order of the drops matters it if. Because it cannot drop a table down another table. It, as as a foreign as a member a ID of as a foreign key. As a foreign key. So, so, if, so for example, if a table, if your recipes or if your 
delivery has as a foreign key linked to the recipe, you can't delete recipes while delivery still exists. Because the table relies on it. The order of your drop I'm tables. sorry? What was that, David? Because the table relies on it. Because yeah. the table relies on it. So you had to change the order of what you did? You changed no, the order of the I'm drop sorry, table. I'm asking, is there, is there a standard way of that? Ah, the standard way is to not leave any orphans. Uh, you, you kill them. The, <laughs> if you have a, if you have a record that, that, that let's say the address and the user's example we had earlier, if, if an address must belong to a user, then we, what we do is we cascade, which is kind of scary, but that's what we normally do. Would you be able to just shift the order of the books through the drop tables to the order of the less, de the less dependent to the most dependent? So that way it goes through that order of dropping the table. So that when it goes to create, then you. Yeah, because yeah, that's how we do it. We yeah, just we, 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 we comment them out. Is there an easier way to do yeah. that? There is an easier way. You don't oh. have to think about the order if you, um, if you say cascade. Let's see if we. Unfortunately, in official docs, they assume you're smart and they don't know like, they don't know that you just want to copy and paste something. <laughs> so they'll have like all these like parentheses and brackets, like explaining what things are that will, that aren't how you're actually supposed to type it. <laughs> That's what happens when you go and try to delete tables on that uh, Postico that rely on each other. It actually pops up a message saying cascade. Is it a question? Is it a question mark? Cut? Is it like an okay or? No, it, it, it won't let you do it. It says this table cannot be deleted because it relies on this. Uh, oh. Hint, cascade. <laughs> hint, cascade. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then the children have to be above the parent. Yes, so yes so when you when the order matters. Let's try and make that happen now. If we run this code. Ah. The other question that ties into that, and we didn't run into this, because oh. we figured it out before we would have run into it. Is there a way to have a table where you create a reference to another table, a foreign key for a table you haven't created yet, but intend to? Uh, can you uh, reference a foreign key in a table you haven't created yet, but you intend to? No. Okay. That's what you did this morning. You had that set for the foreign key. So oh, for creation of tables, you do have to be very careful about the order for delete or dropping of tables, you can use Cascade to help you make sure that you cover and yes. get rid of them. You can't refer to something that's not there, but when you're dropping them, you have to either be careful about the order you drop them or Cascade. Okay. Cool. Oh, I needed to. Run these files. Nice. Okay, so if I switch this order, address. All right. Where do I put the cascade? Hmm, let's find out. Oh, 
think it goes at the end. All right, it just wasn't highlighting red. I haven't typed SQL in a long time, so let's see. Yay! Okay. Yes. But keep in mind, it'll actually delete those things. So if you didn't mean to cascade. Because in that case, it will actually, when you delete the addresses, it will delete everything that happens. It will delete. It'll drop those tables. So could you just do cascade on this? So what happens to the data when you drop a table? <laughs> it's gone. The schema is still there. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's take a look at this the structure of this table. <laughs> Justin, how do I how do I see the structure of my table? Slash D. Slash D. I have ooh yes, I have all these tables. Okay, do I have to view the structure of each one individually? Yes. And how do I do that? Table name at the end of the D. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. It's straightforward. It looks like it has an ID. The lines are coded. Does it? Huh? It's not serial. Oh, it is just an integer. Yeah, that's why another secondary quotes thing usually has a separate table for each one of the serial. So alter column. I'll take <laughs> uh, uh, was it addresses, alter, 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 type, alter, 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 You can alter it, or we can just type in here and just drop it and create it again. Is it can more fun to alter? John Curtis, I blame him. <laughs> you blame <laughs> <laughs> So. It's 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 okay because it, it is an int. However, uh, with the ID column, we definitely need it to be unique because that that is the definition of an ID. It has to be unique. And huge oversight. You're right. Blame the website. It, we did it on several of them. It looks like. Uh -huh. Like I said, blame the website. Yeah. So how do we make a unique ID in? SQL. You just say unique, right? Serial, okay. Serial. I don't know if serial makes it unique or if that just automatically increments it to the next. Just automatically. The table. So if I already had uh, a Somehow, if I already had two non-unique things, I don't think it would be angry. Primary key. <laughs> Primary key will, how do yeah. it, where, there it is. Serial. Yes. So primary key. Primary key. Primary key. No, no, after serial. Instead of that. Way how? Thanks for throwing me under the bus. No, not knowing. No, not knowing. You don't need not knowing. Because it's always debated no matter what. What's the one at the bottom? It implies this. Primary key already implies not null and unique. And the cool thing about primary key is you can put two columns in there to create a unique combination of Sorry, say that again, Robert? I, I was saying the, the cool thing about using primary key instead of unique is you can put a combination of columns in there to create a unique combo of columns. To make a, 
So I can make. So you if you had, say, uh, going back to the user and address example, uh -huh. if you had an address table and it needed, like, you can have the same address and you have multiple people that live there, but you can have a name and an address be a unique combination and that could be your primary key. Oh. So you can have a user ID and an address ID to be your primary key. Fancy. Kind of, it's good like stuff. This, this, or it, it, a better example is probably the like the Grubhub ordering or anything that has like line items. Line so items. You have your, your, you know, your receipt or whatever, and you have your itemized receipt. Those items will be on the same, you know, order ID, but their line number or something will be uh, in combination with the order ID to create the unique primary key. Hmm. So you can, you, it doesn't have to be an integer. It can, it can be any number of things that you want to identify that record. As long as it is capable of creating a unique identifier for that line. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. So. Yeah. All IDs? All IDs. Uh, yeah, all IDs are set to integer. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of all these? What is this? Yeah, what is, <laughs> yeah. that looks like a I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that actually exports. That that's like, good. That's good? Yeah, that's how yeah. You, you type it out. So that that is a weird it? way to type it out, but that's a good, it, that works. The constraint key can use it. That's so how what, it's usually used in uh, this like, would be uh, in Microsoft SQL. Yeah, yeah, it's it, but that. It, will, but it works. If you have a like so a program that will describe your table. Your constraints will automatically pull it like into their own little unique tabular column, so you can kind of identify them quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this. Okay, uh, which part? The whole part. <laughs> the whole part. Let's, just, let's just not miss anything. Let's follow it. Just the constraint. Oh, sorry. When though? With the, with the primary key? I understand serial primary key. I understand what that uh, Beyond that. Beyond, beyond the... What is being introduced from you right now that, uh, I'm sorry, who was that? that was We're not introducing so all of this, this, this here. Yeah. It's, it's a longer handwriting of this here. That's what would, uh, when we export it from the website, the constraint is what popped it. This. Those two things are, do exactly the same thing. So they it just the depends same. upon whether you want to put the constraint in line right next to the piece that you're writing for each row. Or if after you're done writing the whole table, you can add constraints at the bottom. It's just a different way of writing. Oh, okay. It's just two different ways of writing the same thing. You actually use constraints a lot after you create your tables. The not, 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 not really when you when you're creating it. It's usually used after, and then you go ahead and add your constraints to it. The That's usually what it's for. The requirements were to put an ID on there, so I did, and then whenever I exported it, it came up with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, like you're saying, SQL Server and some more advanced uh, like SQL languages will need the constraints uh, details on the table in order to populate uh, additional rules uh, when working with that table. So you can have your primary key and it, you know, will give you the error that you can't delete this primary key because it's foreign key bound to something else. But in order to see what those are at a glance, you have to have that constraints column to describe what the constraints are. So there's, there's benefits to writing. Yeah, it, it's just a longer form of, of writing it out right now, pretty much. Like we're not going to be using any of the analytic tools or anything like that. <laughs> okay. So let's take a break until 930.
and we'll come back to just do a, a recap of uh, creating and inserting data. Thank you. 